behalf of the law school faculty and students, I'd like to welcome you to the Jean and Christine P. Mills Conversation Series. Uh, thank you so much for coming. This series was sponsored through the generous donation of a Duke alum named Amos Mills. And he started the series in honor of his mother and his sister, uh, who were both extraordinary women who were committed to public service. When I first met Mr. Mills many, many years ago, he was very concerned about the state of race relations in this country, and he kept asking me repeatedly, what can we do about uh, this problem? How can we initiate some conversation and engagement about race relations uh, in the United States, uh, and even uh, larger? more internationally. And so we came up with the idea of this series, uh, right, where what we're hoping to do is to bring together a diverse group of people, not just scholars and academics, but activists, uh, locals in the community, to talk about uh, race relations uh, and the complexity of race relations in the United States. We came up with the idea of a conversation series and not a lecture series, because what we wanted to do was to uh, provoke dialogue, right? Uh, not just uh, having uh, consumers or individuals receive information, but actually share insights from your experiences uh, and from your different perspectives. So the idea for tonight is not merely to be lectured to, but to actually involve all of you in a conversation where you can share your insights, your experience, and your knowledge about uh, this particular topic. We are going to be talking about the racial dynamics of immigration reform, uh, which is, of course, a problem of immense importance to our nation, uh, as well as, and I don't want to characterize it as a problem, right? It's an issue of immense importance to this country, uh, as well as to the state. Uh, as many of you know, I don't know if you saw the article in The Independent uh, last week, North Carolina has a large number of undocumented persons. Uh, I think the number is, according to the um, author of the Independent article, 270,000. But according to the Homeland Security uh, uh, Department, division of our government, it's 370,000. And North Carolina is one of the states where there has been a dramatic increase in terms of the, the uh, immigrant population in recent uh, years. I think we're ninth in the nation in terms of uh, undocumented uh, person. So this is particularly important for the state as well as for the country and even uh, more broadly for um, the world. I can't think of a better person uh, to initiate this conversation than Professor Kevin Johnson from UC Davis uh, School of Law. He was uh, he had intended to be here in person uh, tonight, but due to flight difficulties, we've had to improvise a bit, and he is here through video conferencing, so uh, I'm so happy that technology is what it is, right, uh, so that we can have his insights uh, with us in the room. Professor Johnson is a leading expert on immigration law and policy, racial identity, and civil rights. As I mentioned, he's at UC Davis Law School, where he joined the faculty in 1989, and he is an associate dean for academic affairs and a chaired professor of public interest law and Chicana Chicano studies. He's written extensively about Latino and mixed racial identity, as well as uh, on U.S. immigration policy. His latest book, which I'd highly recommend, is Opening the Floodgates, Why America Needs to Rethink Its Borders and Immigration Laws, which was published last year by NYU Press. In addition to a scholarship from which I have personally benefited over the years, what I most appreciate about Professor Johnson is that he is both a scholar and an activist. He serves on the board of directors for the Legal Services of Northern California and the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And I learned today, and I hope you don't mind my sharing this, uh, Professor Johnson, that he is involved in one of the national presidential campaigns uh, giving advice about immigration policy. Uh, and I'm sure that you might want to ask him some questions uh, about uh, those campaigns, which we're all uh, watching with uh, careful attention. So without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome Professor Johnson, who will speak for 20 to 30 minutes, and then we're going to talk about uh, this really complex uh, but important uh, subject. Thanks very much, Professor Johnson. Can you all hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, good. good. Um, my apologies uh, for not making out to, to the Duke. Uh, I very much look forward to introducing, um, but uh, as Professor Jones mentioned, the flight difficulty is primarily um, my fault, um, uh, made it impossible, and 
I'm very pleased to be able to, to talk to you through video teleconferencing. Um, now, I want to talk some about immigration and hopefully we can have a discussion um, because I think it's an understatement to say that immigration is a hot topic. Uh, it's really one of the burning issues of our time. And, if I, and I've, as I've said in writing a number of cases, I think it's one of the civil rights issues of the 21st century. Uh, as a political and legal matter, it's incredibly complex. Uh, and immigration politics also are incredibly complex. Immigration isn't a simple Democrat, Republican issue, red state, blue state issue. It is really much more complicated than that. And legally, uh, the immigration laws are notoriously complex, uh, perhaps only rivaled by the Internal Revenue Code in terms of their complexity. And there's a set of rules in immigration law uh, that some have called immigration exceptionalism. There are things you can see in immigration law that you never see in other bodies of law. You can see racial exclusion, class exclusion, gender inclusion, exclusion. They're upheld by the courts. So you can never imagine being upheld in any other realm of the body of law. And as you know, North Carolina immigration isn't just a regional issue in the Southwest anymore. Immigration is issues that touches all parts of the United States, from Georgia and Pennsylvania to California and Texas, uh, from North and South Carolina to Arizona and New Mexico. And it, as we've seen in the primary season, immigration is often issued in places like Nevada, New Hampshire, and Iowa. To make sure that we're sort of on the, some of the same page when it comes to basic facts, I wanted to outline some, some important, basically undisputed facts when it comes to immigration. Fact number one, uh, we have many undocumented immigrants who live in the United States. The best estimate that we have today is that somewhere between 10 and a half and 12 million undocumented immigrants live in the United States. And this is an increase from 5 to 6 million in the mid-1990s. So from basically 1994 to 2008, we've seen a doubling in the undocumented immigrant population. Fact number two. Most undocumented immigrants come to the United States for jobs. Come here to work. They come here because they can get work when they get here. And there's no social science evidence that shows that very many undocumented immigrants come for any other reason, primarily as jobs. Fact number three. There are two types of undocumented immigrants. There are people who entered without inspection. They came across the border without checking in with the, the, the border patrol. The immigration authority got to the port of entry. That's one group. The other group are people who came here lawfully, enter, entered lawfully on visas. Sometimes it's a business visa, sometimes it's a student visa, sometimes it's a tourist visa. The people came here in visas who overstayed the terms of their visas. And about half of that immigrants are people who entered that inspection, and about half are people who overstayed their visas. And, and the reason that's important uh, is because if you're talking about reducing undocumented immigration, and your primary proposal is border enforcement, then you're really only addressing half the undocumented immigration issue. You're only addressing people who enter without inspection. You're not addressing the half who entered legally but overstayed the terms of their, of their visa. Basic fact number three. Many people believe that the current immigration system has big problems. And I can identify a number of problems or a number of issues that this critic would point to. Uh, one of those I already mentioned. Uh, some would point to the fact that they have a large undocumented immigrant population uh, is, is an issue. Uh, another criticism of the current system is that we have uh, widespread human trafficking going on uh, where people are paying smugglers to get them into the United States. Uh, and as a result uh, of increased border enforcement measures, the smugglers' fees have gone up from a few hundred dollars in the mid-1990s to a few thousand dollars 
uh, today. And that it had some horrible human consequences. It has led to uh, smuggling operations that, that have required people to work off their smuggling debt when they came to the United States. As a result, we've seen increased reports of involuntary servitude and slavery uh, at the hands of smugglers. We also have some unscrupulous smugglers who take people's money and then leave them in the desert to fend for themselves. Another problem many people would point to in the current system, uh, and I refer to it as death on the border. Uh, as a result of increased border enforcement measures that went into place in the 1990s, we've seen thousands of deaths result along the border. Uh, what has happened is that border enforcement operations focus on major cities, cities like San Diego, El Paso, uh, and, and, and other major urban areas, uh, have rerouted undocumented through places where they're more likely to die, through deserts, through mountains, uh, through desolate areas. Uh, and as a result, you know, thousands of people have died in the last 10 years. If you want to get a glimpse of the running death toll from one border, border operation, you can look at a website, www.stopgatekeeper.com. StopGatekeeper.org. In the last, when I looked at that website a few weeks ago, uh, there were over 3,000 deaths attributable to that one, that single border operation. Another problem that many people would identify with the current immigration system is that there's widespread exploitation of undocumented immigrants in the workplace. We currently have a system where there's one labor market for lawful immigrants and U.S. citizens where law applies, minimum wage laws, condition laws, uh, and then we have another labor market for undocumented immigrants, people without proper papers, where basically it operates lawlessly. No minimum wage laws, no social security deductions, uh, no condition protection. And unfortunately, the way that this, this dual labor market system works is that one labor market is almost, almost exclusively, but not completely, uh, people, you know, composed of people of color, and the other labor market is much more mixed. In, some, in this way, we have a labor market that's exploited uh, that has a racial caste quality to it. So many people would identify a good many problems with the current system. And as you all know, over the last few years, few years, there's been a lot of discussion of comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, and, and this really, this discussion really began uh, in December of 2005, when the House of Representatives passed a very punitive immigration bill focusing primarily on enforcement. Um, it was known as the Sensenbrenner Bill. This Sensenbrenner Bill would have done a number of things, including uh, making it a felony to be an undocumented immigrant. The status of being undocumented would be a crime. Uh, this bill um, led to something that's really quite extraordinary in U.S. history. It, it led uh, to unprecedented marches for immigrants on the streets of cities across the United States. We've seen protests before uh, a number of things, um, but we haven't seen, for the most part, pro-immigrant protests in the United States history. Um, but, but we saw on streets of cities, you know, from Los Angeles to San Francisco to Chicago New York, um, to Boston, to Boston uh, across the country, protests of the Benjamin Brenner Bill, protests of the unfair treatment of undocumented immigrants. And it wasn't just undocumented immigrants who were protesting. It was lawful immigrants, and it was citizens as well. In fact, two, two, two uh, U.S. senators were participated in the, in the protest, uh, in the march of one Senator Ted Kennedy and other Senator Barack Obama. Um, so it wasn't just immigrants protesting, uh, it, was, it was a lot of people. And it wasn't just Latinos who were protesting either. In some places like Chicago and Boston and New York, uh, there are a fair number of uh, other groups of immigrants, including Poles and the Irish, participated as well. In any event, after these protests, then there was a renewed discussion of comprehensive immigration reform that took place in the United States Senate. And a sort of comprehensive approach um, 
um, where, the, where they tried, where they floated, and it ultimately failed. And there are three basic parts of this, this comprehensive proposal. One part would have included a guest worker program to bring workers temporarily to the United States to perform labor in certain industries, particularly agriculture. Uh, there was also a, depending on how you want to call it, a, a, a path to legalization for undocumented immigrants or an amnesty program, as someone would say. Uh, and then there was a third part with increased enforcement measures. The idea is, well, you have to have enforcement to stop an increase on the immigrant population. You have to have a legalization to eliminate the undocumented immigrant population that you have. And then you need a guest worker program to, to get those workers who need a job that you can't get Americans to do. That's the rationale in life. So, why, why was there this discussion of comprehensive immigration reform? There was a discussion because many people thought that the current system was broke, uh, that there, there really were too many undocumented immigrants, there wasn't enough, uh, of, enough avenues for lawful workers to get to the United States. And that's in part because the current laws, the current immigration laws, are fairly narrow in who they allow to be admitted in the United States. Uh, you have to have a family member, uh, be a particularly skilled employee, um, fall within a category uh, where you call it diversity uh, immigrant, where you participate in a lottery, a fairly small number, or you have to show that you're a refugee fleeing persecution. Lots of limits, lots of ceilings, lots of numerical. Um, and so it's hard uh, for most unskilled and moderately skilled workers to immigrate to the United States. And when you hear people talk about why don't they just wait in line, uh, you should keep in mind that under our immigration laws, for many unskilled workers, um, unless they have a family member in the country, there's no line for them to wait in. There's no lawful way for them to get into the United States. Uh, and that's because uh, of the, you know, the relatively um, scarce number of visas that are available under, under the statute. Uh, and what does that mean? Uh, that means that um, work, uh, workers and employers uh, can't get together consistent with the immigration laws. It's hard for foreign workers to get here legally. Uh, domestic employers want these foreign workers um, and we'll pay these foreign workers, we'll hire these foreign workers, uh, and, and the result of the current immigration law is that the law is widely violated by both employers and migrants. Uh, you have employers who, uh, with a wink and a nod, hire undocumented immigrants, sometimes with all documents, sometimes not. You have migrants, and a migrant stream that knows very well that they make it to the United States, they can get work here. And there's some law-abiding citizens, uh, otherwise law-abiding citizens, citizens who violate the immigration laws. You may remember the first two nominees for attorney general in, in the Clinton administration. Uh, one of them is Zoe Baird, the other is Kimbo Wood. Uh, they were in line to be the highest law enforcement officer in the federal government. Uh, both of them turned out to be disqualified because they hired undocumented immigrants in the home. That is, you know, Going there, the general counsel for, uh, for a corporation in Kimberly, with a federal judge, are uh, otherwise law abiding, but they violate the immigration law. And it's not just a democratic issue. The Bush administration, with a job at it, um, was nominated to be the Secretary of Labor. Uh, she was, in the end, had to withdraw nomination because it, it came, came out that she had employed and got immigrants in the home. Uh, ironically enough, the first nominee for, for, the, for the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, the person who was in the first head of the Department of Homeland Security, Bernard Herrick, the former police chief of New York City, uh, his nomination had to be withdrawn. And that's because he employed that document in my home. Uh, these are the individuals um, who violated the immigration laws, and there's also large companies as well who violate the immigration laws. It's fairly regular. Uh, regularly, you can read the news about uh, the Walmart and the Tyson Foods who have been indicted or somehow been accused of um, violating the immigration laws. Now, what I try to do in my book, opening the floodgates, why Americans rethink its borders uh, in immigration laws, uh, 
is to come up with what I view as truly comprehensive immigration reform. Immigration reform that we won't have to repeat 5, 10, 15 years from now. Uh, in, in 1986, uh, Congress passed the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which was supposed to be a comprehensive immigration reform of its era and to re reduce any need for future immigration reform. It includes an amnesty program. Uh, it included employer sanctions, that is, provisions that allowed employers who, who hired that immigrants to be sanctioned under the law. Uh, and, and it included a, a, a guest worker program as well, an agricultural guest worker program of sorts, small, relatively small one. Um, but it, it, that was supposed to end the need for comprehensive immigration reform. But as I mentioned before, um, because it is still hard to immigrate the United States lawfully, uh, we saw the growth of an undocumented population. Uh, and we also found it very difficult to enforce the employer sanction laws. Uh, and they really haven't been enforced. So my hope in the book was to come up with a system that allowed for long-lasting immigration reform. And what, what I concluded in the end is that we currently live in a system that in many respects is like the old prohibition era anti-alcohol laws, where the laws are on the book uh, and people violate them rampantly, uh, and they have many negative collateral consequences, criminalizing much conduct, uh, causing some problems with organized crime and violence, uh, reducing the legitimacy of the law, uh, creating a caseload problem in the, in the court, uh, and just generally um, not being complied with. So my proposal in the book is to, in some ways, deregulate the borders, to simplify the law, to make it easier in, to enter the United States, and to reverse a very basic presumption that exists under current immigration law. The current presumption is that unless you can, unless you can establish you fall in one of these categories, family, having family members in the United States, having particular employment skills, being a refugee, or satisfying the diversity of visa requirements, my system would, would presume that you could enter the country uh, unless it was shown that you were a danger to the public or to national security. It would get rid of the complex system of preferences and numerical limits uh, and focus on excluding people from the country who are truly dangerous. People who have committed crimes and been convicted of crimes. Um, this would require detailed background checks. It would require cooperation with intelligence agencies. Uh, and it would require a screening of, of people before the end of the country. So I'm not saying you should get rid of the borders. I'm just saying that you should focus your enforcement efforts on those borders. Now, the book also talks about why we should move to a more open, more liberal admission system. And it addresses three questions. First, it addresses the question, what is enforceable? We have a law that's not enforceable. I think we need a law that is enforceable. So it considers, you know, what kind of immigration law can we enforce? Second question I address in the book is, what kind of immigration law is good for the United States politically, economically, and socially? And as the book has a chapter on the economic benefits of immigration. And I'm happy to talk about some of the, some of the, some of the problems, economic issues, um, that, are, that are brought by immigration. But overall, uh, immigration is good for the economy, according to most, almost all studies. Um, there are some issues. Um, including the impact on both skilled workers uh, and on the state and local governments in terms of the funding services for members. But overall, I think you see net benefits, and that's what the study show. And the third question I address in the book is what kind of immigration law is consistent with this nation's constitutional and moral traditions? 
Uh, we have a constitution that is deeply committed to liberal theory, to a theory of rights, uh, to a theory of individual freedom. Um, that's hard to square with our current immigration laws uh, that are designed to limit rights, limit access, limit freedoms to travel. I'm not saying that open borders or anything like that is compelled by the Constitution, but a more open system is more consistent with a Constitution devoted to individual rights and inclusion. And in some ways, current U.S. immigration laws are very out of sync with any theory of individual rights. Um, we have a system that's designed to keep out the poor, it's designed to keep out working people, it's designed to keep out the disabled, and at various points in our history, it's been designed to keep out racial minorities uh, and political dissidents. Uh, it's hard for me to justify those kinds of exclusions uh, with a constitution like ours and with, a, with the moral traditions we have. Um, in this debate, I also talk about some of the moral costs of our current system. Uh, and how a more open system would reduce some of the very serious moral consequences of our foreign, current immigration enforcement. Um, I mentioned before the death on the border. I mentioned before human trafficking. Uh, another sort of moral cause of our current policy is the, the persistent prevalence of racial profiling in immigration enforcement. Um, minority communities, time and time again, particularly Latino and Asian communities, complain about the racial profiling in immigration enforcement. And this has been sanctioned some by the United States Supreme Court uh, in a case uh, um, decided in the 1970s, the Supreme Court held that one factor that could be considered in an immigration stop is Mexican appearance. Um, it could be the only factor, it could be one factor in an immigration stop. When I teach and lecture in China studies classes, um, you know, in, in the West, um, we have this discussion of what is Mexican appearance? Uh, is there a Mexican appearance? There may be a stereotypical Mexican appearance, um, but there are a great variety of Mexican appearances. I had the opportunity a few years ago of being the, foreign, the then foreign minister of Mexico, Jorge Castaneda. And if I made judgments of nationality based on appearances, my judgment would have been that he was Swedish. Um, if he was blonde and blue eyes, but he was not. He was a Mexican intellectual and, and foreign minister. Uh, but racial profiling is another moral cost of our current system. Uh, and the final moral cost I'll mention is the, the, the exploitation of workers uh, in, a, in a caste kind of system um, based on um, nationality and, and race. So, so that's you know, why, um, those are the reasons that I, I look in the book, why we should more liberally uh, admit immigrants to the United States. And, and I want to just briefly talk about some of the, 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 the objections. Uh, the, the first you know, obvious objection is um, if you allow for liberal admissions, uh, you're going to open the floodgates to the entire world, and everybody's going to come, and we're going to be overrun. Uh, numerically, culturally, politically, socially, and economically. Uh, and I have a number of responses to that floodgate concern, which is a concern you see influencing the courts, including the Supreme Court, in many of its immigration decisions. We're not tight. If we, if we let move just a little bit, we'll be overrun. Um, we have some experience both in the United States, but also in looking around the world to suggest that this floodgate concern is not as great as one might fear. Uh, we don't have hard, um, I, I'm not aware of any studies looking at this, um, but, it, but we should look around a bit. Uh, internally in the United States, there are some pretty significant economic disparities between the states. Uh, I was in Mississippi in the summer a few summers ago. It was very hot, very muggy, uh, and you know, the, the, you know, in part of the state, the economy wasn't particularly good. I could only ask myself, why doesn't everybody move out of Mississippi and come to California? There are jobs, the weather's better, uh, and there's all kinds of reasons why Mississippians stay in Mississippi and most of the world stays in most of the world. Ninety to ninety-five percent. Uh, the people on earth live and die within 100 miles where they were born. Most people don't want to leave the culture, the place, the family, all the things they're familiar with. Uh, 
Um, and that's true for Mississippi and as well as others. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a territory of the United States. Every Puerto Rican is a U.S. citizen. Every Puerto Rican on the island is a U.S. citizen. Uh, every Puerto Rican on the island could, if he or she could get a plane, to be in New York tomorrow. Um, most Puerto Ricans stay in Puerto Rico. There are some people who leave for economic other reasons, but most Puerto Ricans stay in Puerto Rico, even though uh, the economy in Puerto Rico isn't what it is in the mainland, even though the public benefits providing the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico do not equal the public benefits provided to people in the mainland, most Puerto Ricans, for all kinds of reasons, including familiarity with culture, love of the island, love of the language, um, and simple inertia in Puerto Rico. You can also look at the European Union as well. Uh, the European Union allows for internal migration within uh, the member states. And there's a great deal of fear and concern, uh, particularly in Germany and France, when it was talked about, well, when it was discussed uh, that Portugal and Spain would join the European Union. The idea is that the Portuguese would flood the rest of Europe, and the Spanish would as well. Uh, and as it turned out, the European Union did experience that. Uh, most Portuguese, Portuguese stayed in Portugal, most, most Spanish stayed in Spain. Well, you might say, well, the difference between economically between Spain and Portugal and Germany and France is not as great as the economic difference between Mexico and the United States. That's true. But the EU has flourished and expanded. And the two most recent members, Bulgaria and Romania, their economies aren't all that different from France and Germany uh, as Mexico is from the United States. Uh, now, there are some concerns with mass migrations from Bulgaria and Romania that have led some transitional rule from the migration. But in the end, Bulgaria and Romania will be full members of the EU. So I think that if you look at some of the things that have happened around the world, you see that maybe the concern with mass migrations um, are, are somewhat overstated. There might be some population shifts with a more liberal system, um, but maybe not the mass migration that people greatly fear. Uh, the, the, the other sort of concern, obvious concern, with more liberal emissions is, God, how do you talk about more liberal emissions in, in a, an era of terrorism, in a time of the war on terror, in a time of concern with national security. And, and my argument is uh, that a more open system is a system that can be safer in terms of national security and public safety. We have a very scattershot system now designed to deny as many people as possible. It's not particularly good about screening out people who are true dangers to national security and public safety. Uh, we have a system now where between 10 and 12 million people live off the books. Uh, and because in most states they can't get driver's licenses, uh, those that 10 and 12 million people aren't part of the primary um, criminal, you know, the driver's license system that's used in criminal law enforcement by police across the United States. In my system, rather than sort of for, for, for Rather than having the Border Patrol trying to come up with some reason for keeping everybody out, uh, they would focus on true dangers to national security. Uh, and if you diminish and decrease the undocumented population, you decrease the number of people living off the books who are off the radar screen in terms of, of ordinary criminal law enforcement, and you make it, <coughs> make it a safer nation. Uh, and we've seen in other areas of law more focused law enforcement often is better law enforcement. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the customs enforcement area, a few years ago, um, the agency was accused of racial profiling. Uh, and um, it came up with some regulations limiting officer discretion in making customs inspections at the border. Uh, the result was uh, increases uh, in um, apprehensions of, of contraband coming across the border and decreased number of inspections. It was more focused, more regulations in some ways, more rules for area, but better yield. And, and this, this, this could be somewhat the same. Now, many people uh, have asked me, well, do you think you know, a more liberal admission system is going to happen? And 
And my answer would be probably not. But I could see something happening in the United States like it happened in Europe. I could see something akin to the European Union in the United States. Uh, we have the North American Free Trade Agreement that allows for the free trade of goods and services. Uh, it allows for the free flow of capital across borders. That's not without controversy, as we know from the discussions in Ohio. Um, but the EU began in a similar way, uh, and it eventually moved into free labor migration. I might see a system uh, at some point in time where NASA evolved, in, there, NASA evolved into a North American Union uh, and labor as well as goods, services, and capital is allowed to move across borders. Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet, uh, but at various points in time, uh, we have had discussions with Mexico of some kind of migration agreement. Indeed, right before September 11th, the Foreign Minister of Mexico and, and Senator uh, Hillary Clinton um, were, were together at a conference in Washington, D.C., talking about the possibility of some kind of migration agreement with Mexico. In fact, the first Vicente Fox administration, that was one of his primary goals. Uh, he failed to achieve that. And one of the reasons he failed to achieve that was um, September 11th intervened. Uh, and there was no discussion for several years of any kind of freer migration agreements, or freer migration across borders. What happened after September 11th uh, was they focused on closing the borders and border enforcement, border fences, uh, more scrutiny of, of, of temporary visitors and the like. But if you're asking what's more likely to happen, a liberal admission system for all nations, but, uh, or a more focused European kind of model in the United States, I say something something like the latter is more likely. Now, I've talked for a while. I'd be happy to uh, take questions or, or comments. In some ways, I feel lucky here today uh, because um, nobody can throw anything at me or anything like that. Sometimes I give a talk. I gave a talk in Dallas recently, uh, and and I was the first one talking in the morning. The first question was um, after I, I talked about my book. The first question was. It wasn't really a question, it was more a statement. Uh, it, it was, what part of the illegal don't you understand? Uh, the second question was, uh, you should be tried for treason because you want to give away American sovereignty. The third question was, it was from a city council member of a small town nearby. Uh, she said, well, you don't believe in enforcing the immigration laws. Do you believe in enforcing the DUI laws? I didn't think that anything I said um, suggested I didn't believe in enforcing the laws. Um, but I have the benefit of being a little bit distant from you tonight. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions that you might have. A little bit distant? <laughs> OK. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Johnson. Um, I will ask the first question, just to get the conversation going. And Kevin, uh, Professor Johnson, can you hear me? Okay, um, and because I've been socialized to be a law professor, of course there is like a long introduction to this question. Um, but bear with me. This is one of my favorite quotes about uh, immigration policy, and it's from an anthropologist named Ralph Linton, who wrote uh, in 1937 the following, and there is a, a question that follows um, for, for Professor Johnson as well as for all of you. Uh, remember, this is supposed to be a conversation so you can engage with him and you can also engage with each other, and I encourage you to do so. Anyway, he wrote, quote, there can be no question about the average American's Americanism or his desire to preserve his precious heritage at all cost. Nevertheless, some insidious foreign ideas have already warmed into his civilization. Thus, Dawn finds the unsuspecting patriot garbed in pajamas, a garment of East Indian origin. He will begin his stay with coffee, an Abyssinian plant first discovered by the Arabs. Meanwhile, he reads the news of the day, imprinted in characters invented by ancient Semites by a process invented in Germany upon a material invented in China. As he scans the latest editorial, pointing out the dire results, uh, results to our institutions of accepting foreign ideas, he will not fail to thank a Hebrew god in an Indo-European language that he is 100%, by the way, the decimal system was invented by the Greeks, American, uh, from Americo Vespucci, uh, the uh, Italian geographer, right? Um, so there is this observation about the benefits, right, of immigration and the benefits of diversity. And we like to tell ourselves as a country that we are a land of immigrants, right? 
Um, so the question, uh, Professor Johnson, is if that is our mythology, if that's what we like to tell ourselves, then why is there so much resistance today uh, and so much outrage over the idea of undocumented uh, immigrants in this country? Why is Lou Dobbs getting so much traction? Is it just that there's a correlation between higher numbers and excessive xenophobia, or is something else going on here? And just to be provocative, may I just ask, is it the fact that many of these uh, persons are brown? So I'm tying uh, immigration with, with race a bit. No, I, I, I'm glad you did that. Um, I think in the United States, historically, we have seen a deep ambivalence about immigrants. On the one hand, we embrace diversity. We embrace the idea that we're the land of the huddle masses, we're a melting pot. On the other hand, we've had sporadic episodes of serious anti-immigrant xenophobic explosion to uh, the immigrants today. Uh, and it's, it's, there's a number of things that work. Um, but, but I do think that there's a deep ambivalence about a change, about foreigners, and, and, and about immigrants. And, and it's, a, it's amazing how over time um, the immigrant group may change, but the objections to them don't change. Uh, in, in colonial America, um, you had Benjamin Franklin complaining about German immigrants and how they couldn't assimilate according to their, given their complexion uh, and their language. Later, you had Irish immigrants who people complained about uh, were racially different, prone to laziness and drunkenness, and could not assimilate, uh, and, and uh, were changed in country in bad ways. Uh, later on after that, you had Chinese immigrants, and you have the United States Supreme Court saying this is permissible. Uh, Chinese immigrants who were, were viewed as unassimilable, uh, who were racially different, uh, who were culturally different, uh, and um, lived in their, their ethnic enclave, and, and also, you know, were, were bad in a number of ways. They were oriented toward crime and drugs and, and the like. Uh, later on, it was you know, Japanese immigrants. Later on, it was Southern Eastern Europeans, primarily, you know, uh, Jewish immigrants. Later on, um, it, you know, it was um, Mexican immigrants. And actually, one episode that I, I always like to talk about that very few people know about uh, is that during the Great Depression, uh, there, when, when there was an effort to, to uh, you know, save jobs for Americans and save public benefits for Americans, there was a mass campaign to remove from, um, from, from the United States uh, persons of Mexican ancestry and, re quote, repatriate them to Mexico. Uh, they were viewed as racially different uh, and uh, not deserving of American benefits. And I say repatriation in quotes um, because in, in parts of uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, Michigan, where these deportation campaigns took place, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was U.S. citizens of Mexican ancestry who were subjected to removal. One of my colleagues uh, on the UC Davis faculty on the, um, who was once on the uh, California Supreme Court, Cruz Renoso, uh, he, he was born in Orange County in Southern California. Uh, one day, his father, who was a Mexican immigrant, came home from work and said, you know, they're sending going to send us back to Mexico. Uh, we're going to go to Mexico before they, you know, put us on a train. And Cruz, little Cruz, his response was, where's Mexico? I've never been there before. Uh, he was a U.S. citizen. But there was roughly a million people uh, who were repatriated. About two-thirds of them were U.S. citizens, many children. Uh, and, and the claim was they, they want to assimilate their foreigners and immigrants. And you can go, go on and on throughout the US history. And, and, and at any point, you can see a number of things that work, I think, when it comes to the immigrants of the day. You see, um, particularly in times of social stress, um, you, know, you see concerns with change. Uh, there is concern with change. And none of us feel entirely comfortable with the marketplace that we're used to. Uh, where people are speaking different languages than we're accustomed to. Uh, people react differently, but a lot of people feel somewhat uncomfortable. Um, there, there's a bit of economic insecurity. Uh, there is a concern uh, that, you know, gosh, you know, I'm barely getting by and you know, I'm, I'm in competition with, with others in both you know, the employment market and in other arenas for you know, precious 
uh, benefit from our society. Uh, I, I think sometimes I think that's misplaced, but I think that's a real concern among some people. Uh, and then I think there there is some just out and out racism and ageism uh, that, that come into play. And today, one of the things you see um, is uh, that uh, a lot of the debate about immigration uh, really focuses on immigrants from Mexico. Uh, and oftentimes, and I think the, the Mexican-American citizen community realizes, uh, the debate about immigration often really is a debate about Mexicans generally. Um, you know, in California, for example, uh, 10 years ago, uh, the, the voters passed an initiative known as Proposition 187 that it would have, would have denied public access, uh, access by adult immigrants to public schools and denied them public benefits. It was struck down uh, on, on supremacy clause grounds. Uh, at, the, at the outset of the, the initiative campaign, uh, about two to one, I mean, you know, two out of every three Mexican American citizens supported the measure. Uh, and I think they supported the measure because they weren't particularly sympathetic towards uh, you know, benefits received by, you know, by, by immigrants. By the end of the campaign, the exit polls show that it is split, that two out of three Mexican Americans opposed Proposition 187. And why do I think that happened? I think that Mexican American citizens understood the debate really wasn't about immigration, really wasn't about access to public benefits, but was about their status in society and whether they were wanted or unwanted. So I, I think that you know, if you look at the debate, it's hard to say that you know there may be some legitimate uh, reasons for being concerned with immigration, but among some people in some quarters, uh, there's some concern. There's some concern with race and the race of today's immigrants. Now, one of the things that's interesting to me is that throughout history, this conception of race has um, changed over time. That you know, at one time the Germans were thought as racially different. That, that, you know, the Irish were thought as racially different. Uh, later, you know, you know uh, Southern Eastern Europeans were thought as racially different. In, in that way, I think immigration laws are a nice way of viewing how race is a social construction and how society reacts to that social construction. But I think that race is one fact in the entire debate. Uh, and one of my colleagues at UC Davis, Bill Hing, in evaluating the comprehensive immigration reform proposal uh, that was defeated last summer, his view was that some of the provisions really were designed to reduce uh, immigration from Asia. And he referred to the Comprehensive Immigration Reform as the, you know, the Anti-Asian Exclusion Act of 2007. Uh, and he thought that's what you know, really was all about. And I think there's, you know, there's some of that there. Uh, and there's some people who feel that quite strongly. Okay, I could ask a million questions, but I think that I should exercise some uh, discipline here and allow other people uh, to speak. Although there is a burning question that I'll just plant in your ear, Professor Johnson, about the fact that there are many majority minority states uh, developing and there is this fear uh, of a loss perhaps of cultural hegemony uh, in the United States as uh, we become increasingly uh, diverse. But you don't have to respond to that right now. I just thought I'd plant it. Uh, uh, in your ear. If you would speak into the microphone, um, that would be helpful for, for everyone. Yeah, there are microphones right in front of you. Um, I guess this is maybe shifting a little bit away from race. Um, you mentioned that if we were to open the floodgates, as you called it, um, that you don't think there would be mass migration, but um, that there would be population shifts. And I guess my question is twofold. I'm curious to know what you what you really uh, foresee or mean by population shifts and how those shifts will um, affect things other than the racial dynamics in the country, such as the economy and other public, you know, healthcare and other public um, benefits. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I, I think that's a, a fair enough question, and I think you know one of the things that that
you know, only when pressed economically or otherwise. Um, I mean, you, you saw a mass migration from uh, New Orleans, uh, but that's still, uh, some people refuse to move even in the face of danger. Um, but but you, you, it's events like that that lead to mass migration. Or, you know, the threat war in Central America, um, a war in Iraq, which leads to, you know, a flow of refugees out of Iraq. I guess my sense is that, you know, that there, there will be some population adjustments, but we'll, we won't see the mass migration that, that we fear. Now, to the extent you're worried about that, and, and that's a fair enough concern, then I think you talk about some transitional rules until you're comfortable with the level of migration you're going to get. Uh, maybe you have to have limits for several years, like limits on Bulgarian and Romanian um, migration in the EU if you're really worried about a massive shift. Now, now the second point is, is really an important one. Yeah. You said, well, what about the cost of immigration and the cost of the population shift? Uh, and, I, and I think one of the things that's very important that people don't quite realize uh, is that overall there, there are big economic benefits to the federal government due to immigration. Most, uh, a majority of undocumented immigrants, for example, pay taxes. Uh, they can pay taxes, not, even though they don't have a social security number. Uh, they can use tax identification numbers. And they're not eligible for many tax benefits that, that other working people are eligible for. They're not eligible, for example, like for the earned income tax credit. Uh, but many, the majority of undocumented immigrants do pay taxes. They also pay cell taxes and businesses benefit and earn more profits and their tax on that. So there, there are some significant benefits that go to the federal income tax coffers. Um, and one article by Francine Lipman, uh, actually used to be a tax lawyer at a law firm in Southern California, is now focusing on this, shows that you know, there are billions of dollars of benefits that go to the federal government every year. Another benefit that goes to the federal government due to immigration is that many uh, undocumented immigrants work on fake social security numbers. Uh, and they work on those, those fake social security numbers, and what happens is that social security contributions are deducted from their paycheck, go to the federal government, um, but they're never going to be able to collect social security benefits because these are fake social security numbers. They're not there. So these people are contributing to a system that they're never going to be able to get money out of. Uh, and they are heavily subsidizing the current social security. So there are these benefits going to the federal government. Uh, one of the problems is, is that many times state and local governments that provide services uh, don't get the money that they need from the federal government to get the benefits. Uh, for example, uh, public schools. Uh, the Supreme Court in a case called Fire vs. Go held that undocumented immigrants have to, be, have to have access to public school education in these cases as well. Uh, that can be expensive, particularly in some jurisdictions. Uh, that's usually paid for at, at state and local tax coffers. Uh, and um, so many state and local governments are really struck uh, by you know, that immigrant population. And it can, the same might be true for the immigrant population if we have some population adjustments. Uh, another cost is emergency health services, emergency um, you know, hospital care. Um, everybody. Um, you know, if you're, if you're in, a, in a car accident, they'll take you to the local, and you don't have any insurance, they'll take you to the local, um, you know, uh, emergency room, and, and, and I'll try to save your life. There, there, there are, are, and that can be costly, particularly in some parts of the country. Then the question is, this is the question, suppose you have concern with those costs. The question is, what do you do? What do you do? Uh, you could try to close the borders, which is proven very difficult to do, or you try something that some states are trying. You can try to get money from the federal government uh, to reimburse you for some of the cost of immigrants. Um, a couple of years ago, Janet Napolitano and Bill Richardson, the governors of, of Arizona and New Mexico respectively, they declared states of emergency along their southern border. Uh, and, and the claim was, oh, we, we have so many immigrants it's out of control, we have an emergency. Uh, so I think that Janet Napolitano and Bill Richardson are anti-immigrant or, or trying to fan the fires of anti-immigrant sentiment. No, I think what they're trying to do uh, is to get some money out of the federal government and understand that they declare a state of emergency, they're going to be eligible for some federal benefit program uh, and get some economic assistance. Some states, including California and some others as well, have made it a, a point of negotiating with the federal government to try to get some assistance uh, in paying for cost of immigrants. 
But I think if you're worried about you know, the cost, particularly at the state local level, uh, you, you, you should look not at closing the borders, but at getting assistance from the federal government, which is in charge of regulating immigration. And, and just as a footnote, I think one of the reasons that so many state and local governments have had it passing these anti-immigrant ordinances, states like, um, well, like Oklahoma and Arizona, <coughs> that well, also localities like, you know, Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and Farmers Branch, Texas, I think that they're doing it in part, I mean, for, for these economic reasons. They're, they're fed up with the cost. Uh, and they're, they're frustrated, uh, and um, you know, they're, they're trying to do something. Uh, I think what they're trying to do is misguided that they should be focusing on federal government, government for money. But, but I think that you know, the cost of immigration at the local level is one of the reasons why you're seeing these local ordinances. Yes, I, I guess what I have is less a question than uh, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on the sort of birthright citizenship that we have in this country and is that something that, that should be addressed with, with some of the changes because I don't know I don't know if that makes migrations permanent more than I, I don't know I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the issue yeah um, it, it, it's a the way that the 14th Amendment has been interpreted uh, and it was based on a long you know long tradition as well in the common law in England was that if you're, for the most part, if you're born in the United States, you are, are a citizen of the United States. And there are some exceptions uh, for being born uh, outside the United States, the immigration and nationality laws. One of the issues that common law professors, immigration professors have been debating a lot about lately is whether John McCain who was born in the, you know, the Panama Canal Zone is a natural born U.S. citizen eligible to be president? Uh, actually, the New York Times ran an article last week. Uh, <coughs> I, I don't think that there is a credible argument for eliminating birthright citizenship absent a repeal of the 14th Amendment. Um, most common law professors agree with that, and, and I think that you know, what the 14th Amendment was designed to do was to avoid the kind of issue uh, that came up in Dred Scott. If somebody was born here, was classified as non-citizen, couldn't invoke the jurisdiction of the federal court. Um, and I think that under the current interpretation of the 14th Amendment, you're born here, you're a citizen. There are a lot of big benefits to that, like a clear, bright line rule on a very critically important question, uh, citizenship or not. Uh, so I, I don't squarely address birthright citizenship in my book, although I don't see any colorable argument for uh, eliminating under the current 14th Amendment uh, as it stands. And I, and every year, Congress passes some kind of resolution or passes some kind of bill, or proposes something in Congress, proposes a bill that would do away with it. I just don't see it happening. I don't see it being constitutional. Uh, and I don't see any necessarily any reasons for it as well. Um, it's, um, you know, it's, um, the current system, you know, there, there are some issues with it, but I don't see it as um, that big of a problem. Um, you, you talked a lot about the, the financial implications of immigration. Uh, <clears throat> You talked about some of the benefits, um, health care cost. Uh, our health care system is already very strained. Um, a lot of the uh, individuals who come across the border and work here, they are, it, it's a noble effort that they come here to get jobs and, and in many cases send dollars back home to their families. That's dollars that are earned in the U.S. sent back uh, to, their, to Mexico to be uh, spent there. Uh, you talked about the state of the emergency situation where they get dollars from the federal government. Well, the federal government doesn't just get it. They get it back from us. They tax us. And, and uh, <clears throat> my thought is you, you kind of treated this as a racial issue, but my personal opinion, if there was Caucasians over there coming across that had the same financial implications to us, I, I wouldn't feel any different. That's just my thought. <clears throat> 
Not really a que um, not really a question, just a statement, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, you know, I think that you know, you're right. Like that, that the government is really Sir, um, it seems to me that uh, there's a myth, I don't know if it's true or not, that uh, there are a lot of jobs that are available here that American employers can't get jobs for them, and that these jobs are being taken by illegal aliens. And then the people who are coming here that are undocumented say that we're only performing work that nobody else will do. What? What's Statistics. So, what is, are the facts on both of the, on both sides of that issue? What is the truth, if you can, if you know? I mean, I think the most economists will tell you that um, if you pay the, if you pay a wage, you can get workers to do almost any kind of work. Uh, and I think that uh, it's really a wage issue. Uh, markets determine what kind of workers you, you can get and how many workers you can get. The higher wage you pay, the more likely you're going to get workers. You, 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 you pay a, a garbage men well, right? you're going to get enough to do the job. I mean, you get enough to do the job. I, I think um, my, my general view is um, the employers who want cheap labor uh, want to hire people to hire Dr. Irving. And what they say is we can't get Americans to do it. Well, it may be the case you can't get Americans to do that labor if you pay such a low wage uh, and that nobody's going to be checked because there are other jobs they can do for a better wage. And, and my view is that, uh, and this is one um, sort of important issue, I think, is that if you're really worried about wages for workers, and I am, um, uh, then I think what you want to do is make sure that in all labor markets, you have minimum wage and condition laws enforced. Uh, if I want to benefit, if I want to help low wage US citizens, to me the answer is not trying to close the borders. It's trying to come up with a system so that you can enforce minimum wage laws. And if you don't like the, how low the minimum wage law is, focus on increasing that. Uh, if you don't like the condition protection, focus on that. Because I think it's much more likely um, that you can protect workers, all workers, um, then you can close the borders. Uh, I, so I see one of them as a possible option, I see the other as not. So when I hear, uh, specifically just brought up all the time by folks like Patrick Buchanan and Lou Jobs, that undocumented immigrants 
hurt African American workers by undertaking wage scales, I said, I would say, I say two things. One, it's ironic that Pat Buchanan is sticking up for black workers. He rarely does so in other circumstances. And the, the second thing I'd say, well, maybe, maybe he's right. There is some undercutting of African American workers in, in the labor market. Then the question is how you deal with that. I, I say you deal with it by enforcing minimum wage laws uh, and condition laws in all, in all labor markets, uh, not, just, not, not just the legal labor market. Um, but I think, you know, I, I tend to be skeptical of things like guest worker programs. Uh, for exactly the reason you, you alluded to. Guest worker programs, um, employers and we need them because we can't get American workers. And I just don't believe that to be entirely true. You can get American workers to work in agriculture if you pay enough. Um, um, but you know, if you want to pay you know, below minimum or, or a low, very low wage for backbreaking labor, you're not going to get them. If, if I may just add one more other thing. There are some people who believe that there are certain jobs that Americans will not work. And you talk to some immigrants and they say, well, listen, uh, uh, some people say, I can't stand the sun. It's too hot. Uh, I'm not going to get out there in the sun and work. It's too hard. But let the uh, illegal aliens do it. They can stand the heat better. This is a belief. And there are people who will tell you uh, that regardless of the minimum wage, there are certain jobs that Americans now would just not work, will not do, and therefore we got to go outside and get somebody else to, 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 to do that work. And, and I guess I said I don't really believe that. And I don't think Mexican workers deal with the sun any better than anybody else. It's hot. Um, but I know some people say exactly what you said. I just, I, I just, I just don't necessarily believe that. That just goes back to connect to the issue of race, though, because it's the same thing with African Americans and slavery. It's like they said that no one else would do these jobs, and you just assume that certain races are going to step up and fill these positions. This is just. I think it's just, it's a lot of assumption and social construction of like, we're classifying people based on race, we're, we're all people, you know, like, that's ridiculous to say that. Yeah. That was the statement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a phrase that I find troubling, um, but I've heard used, and actually somebody I know was writing an article, used the phrase that, that you know, being worked like a Mexican, I'm not going to be worked like a Mexican. Um, you know, talking, interviewing some citizens, you know, and I find that to be a, for, for to to be a problematic way of looking at it. I mean, um, um, I do know that undocumented workers, Mexican undocumented workers, have been exploited and worked literally to death in circumstances, certain circumstances. Um, and I think they're working uh, for for a wage that's better than they could get. Uh, in their native country and, and feel that they're compelled to work for that wage uh, as an alternative to what they would get in their native country. Um, but I don't, I mean, um, I, I don't think that, you know, if you look at jobs in the United States, I mean, it's really a question of what you pay. Uh, and, you know, and there, there may some, be some low status jobs that are hard to fill in certain circumstances, like working in McDonald's. But I don't think it's necessarily because it's hard work, it's not easy work, I'm not saying it is. Uh, some, there are some low status jobs that may be hard to fill in certain circumstances, but if you pay enough, you get enough people to to, um, to fill them. And interestingly enough, in certain when it's been necessary, uh, people have been able have been required to compete for low skilled workers, um, and have been done it through wages uh, and related economic incentives. In New Orleans, after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, some of the fast food restaurants couldn't get people, couldn't get enough people because there was so many people left. So Burger King was giving bonuses of several thousand dollars to be agreed to stay for a year or two, uh, and they got people. They filled the position. Uh, I think it's really a supply and demand type of issue. But I do understand um, you know, this idea that you know, undocumented immigrants will do work that Americans want to. I understand that people say that, uh, and I think people act on that assumption. I was, a, you know, I was with my wife at a winery a while ago. Somebody was introducing the owner, and I, and I said something like, gosh, it must be hard running a winery. There's a lot of work that has to be done in one of these places. And he said, oh, it's no big deal. You get the next thing to do. Um, which made my friend, the friend who introduced me embarrassed, my wife upset, and I wasn't happy either. Um, but um, I, I 
by now that perception exists out there. Um, I just, I'm, I, I think some of your arguments are a little inconsistent when you're when you're proposing a market solution for for labor on one hand, and also using that argument that there's not going to be a floodgates, but then you're going to use some other governmental uh, construction of a of a artificially high wage of minimum wages, which to me is going to bring more people. You're you're people are coming for these really crappy jobs at low wages now, but if you put everybody up at a higher wage with better work standards, it seems to me that's going to, you know, and they don't have to risk their lives to come here, it seems to me that you're going to really have a floodgate problem. Yeah. I mean, the inconsistency, it's a fair enough observation, is I'm asking for deregulation of the immigration laws uh, with more regulation of the labor market. Uh, and I'm talking about less law in terms of immigration and more law, perhaps, and more law enforcement when it comes to wage and labor protection. I'm not necessarily saying you should increase the minimum wage or um, improve the condition protection, but I am saying that if you're going to have wage, I mean, if you're really worried about wages, you should focus on wages, not closing the borders. If you're really worried about conditions, the worker conditions, you should focus on conditions, not closing the borders. And more importantly, I'm saying, if you're really worried about workers, what you should really be worried about is the current system where you have one labor market with no protections, where workers are exploited, where employers have the incentive to expand that labor market, uh, have more workers, have more work done. But on the other labor market, you have law applied uh, and it's a smaller labor market and there's a few people benefit. Uh, I think that you know the worst thing for American workers, um, you know, system workers, is having uh, a, a labor market uh, that's totally unregulated that really undercuts you know, their wage scale. And, and that's the current system we have. But I'm not necessarily saying you should increase the minimum wage, increase you know, condition protections. I'm just saying you should have one uniform set of wage and labor protections, uh, and you should enforce it uniformly uh, to the benefit of all workers. And if, and if you're really worried about wages and conditions, then deal directly with that. Don't deal with it indirectly by building a 13-foot fence or um, you know, use, putting more technology on the border. Focus on what you what the real real issue. Is. Yeah. What are the chances of working of the U.S. government working with Mexico to improve economic and social conditions there, so that people aren't as tempted to move into these unsafe conditions here? Yeah. And one of the one of the ways, one of the reasons that people migrate uh, is um, for economic opportunity in the United States. If they had economic opportunity in their home country and better economy in their home country, they're more likely to stay home. Uh, and so some would say that you know, if you really want to decrease migration pressures, you should focus on developing the Mexican economy uh, and, and you should, should build that economy uh, as much as you can improve that economy. And actually, the Mexican economy has improved some of the time. Uh, and and um, NAFTA was viewed as a way of improving the Mexican economy and decreasing migration pressures. Uh, the problem with, with most, many people that didn't have a NAFTA is that it, it, it made, it perhaps led to economic growth, but it led to some, um, some greater economic disparities in the Mexican economy where many people, particularly displaced agricultural um, farmers and workers, uh, locked out. Uh, and you know, had no alternative except to leave their land in the United States. Um, but NASA hasn't been quite the answer. But some would say we should pour money into economic development in, in Mexico uh, if we're really worried about migration. And I'm not necessarily averse to that. I don't necessarily think that's a, a bad idea. But it's very hard to convince you know, Congress to do things, invest in a foreign country to begin with, given all the issues we have to invest in here. And two, Economic development is a notoriously slow process. Uh, it's a lot longer than two presidential terms uh, and many congressional, you know, yeah. stints and Senate stints. So it's hard because it takes a long time and not, you know, not fail safe, obviously. Uh, and uh, but some would say that if you're really interested and you get government in, in improvement in you know migration pressures, you should improve Mexican economy. Um, I'd say that's easier. Said that that 
have a question for you, Professor Johnson. You know I'm a huge fan of Alexandra Portis, who's a sociologist, I believe, at Princeton. Uh, and he writes in Immigrant America that border control in the United States, at least in 2005, was the largest arms-bearing branch of the federal government, uh, except for the military itself, with a budget of $1.4 uh, million. But notwithstanding all of this increased attention to border security and border control and this infusion of, of resources, right, uh, the flow across the border has not ceased. And in fact, despite these massive increases in spending, the probability of apprehension has declined from 0.32 to 0.10, right? So we're spending a lot of money thinking about fences, but it, not, it may not necessarily be producing the results that uh, these proponents are advocating or hoping to uh, secure. The other observation he makes in terms of increased spending on border control is that there's always been a substantial presence in the United States of uh, workers from Mexico, right? And what has historically been the case is that these patterns have been more cyclical or seasonal in nature. And what's happened with these increases in border security is that you're getting a more permanent population in the United States because it's, it costs more now, right, uh, to come back into the United States because you may have to hire someone to assist you to circumvent the heightened security requirements. So uh, there's this counterintuitive uh, outcome that's being produced, right, as a result of increased security. It's called costing more for people to actually get into the United States because they're having to hire services. And so once they get in, right, they tend to stay, which is one of the reasons why you see this dispersion of persons in the United States uh, throughout the country as opposed to persons being located in particular regions. Uh, could you comment on those observations? To have I accurately uh, summarized what uh, the data is showing? I think they're, they're exactly right. You've seen a, a doubling in the undocumented population from five to six to 10, 12 million people over the last 15 years, which has also coincided with the largest border enforcement buildup in United States history. We have, you know, at a time when President Clinton was trying to balance the budget, reducing budget to most agencies in the federal government, you know, the, the Border Patrol, the INS, doubled, tripled, quadrupled over his time in office. Uh, it's, it's the size of this budget. And, and uh, the efforts to, to close the border to try to decrease the, the traffic of migrants increased astronomically after September 11th uh, because uh, a great deal of concerns with terrorism and a, and a perceived need to close the border. Uh, and what has happened um, is that, um, well, two, two things, and I might quibble with one of the observations, but for the most part, I think they're true. Uh, you, you, you've seen people come to the United States for the same reasons they used to come for, um, you know, jobs. Um, and, and over time, at very much time, you know, um, there have been some reductions, at least temporarily in migration, but for the most, the, the flow has continued. Um, but one of the unintended consequences of border enforcement uh, has been to increase the number of people who stay in the United States. Uh, there used to be, and it's fairly common, very common, you could predict, you know, um, uh, you know, train ridership schedules in the southern part of California, for example, uh, around the holiday season, um, because so many people would make the track back to Mexico to, to visit family, or, you know, for the holidays for Easter, uh, you, you, you can, you can you, there, there's a large sort of migration back and forth. Um, and what happened after the border enforcement built up uh, and after September 11th is that people stopped going back and forth. And, and, and in part it's because of the smuggling and the seas, you had to pay smugglers, but also it was because it was deadly to cross the border. If you made it by once, uh, you didn't want to take that risk, risk again. Uh, and, and so it's deadly with or without smugglers. So I, I think that one of the unintended consequences of border enforcement is to increase the undocumented population by making uh, folks more likely to stay in the United States than, than, than to go back. Now the dispersal across the United States, I think it, it, there's a number of factors at work, not just the fact that people are here more permanently, but I think that um, people uh, in different parts of the country, employers in different parts of the country, have seen the benefits of cheap labor and are trying to get a part of that and are hiring undocumented immigrants. 
uh, in, in the, you know, the, the poultry industry, the beef industry, um, you know, through in the Midwest, through parts of the South, and you've seen a, a large, you know, immigrant um, flow uh, of people, and I think in part it's just because of jobs. Uh, in, in part, there was an effort by employers to, you know, hire undocumented immigrants and to um, move union jobs to non-union workers and pay them less. Uh, and and um, yeah, that that led to, to, to migration. And, and one of the interesting things is that, to me anyway, uh, you know, from 1990 to 2000, uh, the largest growth in the Hispanic population, uh, over 400 percent, was in Arkansas. Uh, and, and one of the reason, reasons for that was just you know the the, the reliance uh, on, on the poultry industry on immigrant labor from, from Mexico. Uh, it's not the only reason. And, and the thing about Mexican immigrants, it's true about other immigrants too, uh, is that once there's a group of folks uh, who settle in a community, other people from you know that you know who are part of that same community back in, in the native country tend to go there. That's why you see things like. Uh, a significant Hmong population uh, in Merced, which is even very far from here, and, and a fairly significant thick Indian population in Yuba City, which also is very far from here. Uh, so, so, you know, and that's why you, know, you see, um, you know, sort of pockets of different groups, immigrant groups in, in different parts of the country. So I think that, um, you know, that that it has to do with labor flows and, and the fact that you know, border enforcement has had counterintuitive consequences. I mean, one of the things that I don't think people realize uh, is that, um, or that policymakers realize, is that by making it a life or death consequence, um, or making making it a life or death event, whether you cross the border, um, some people have well, people are less likely to cross. There may be somewhat fewer people willing to cross, but there are thousands of people who are willing to take that risk. I was in, you know, in a, uh, a small village south of Tucson, Arizona about a year ago, uh, and the town, it was a, a town that had previously had been just a, a really a small village, small sleepy village, and it's become, because of the way the immigration force had worked, it's become a major border hub. Uh, and in town Plaza, you see you know, thousands of people, you know, sort of trying to make deals to get a, a ride to close the border where a smuggler would take them over the border. Uh, and there are, you know, sort of commercial operations where it's very organized, where you have, you know, five different groups going at the same time across the border, knowing that somebody's going to make it, even if they all didn't make it. Okay, because the Border Patrol couldn't go after all five groups. But the thing that struck me, and I, I'll never forget it, really, is that I, I went to a place, a house that had been converted to a small dormitory, uh, and there's a bunch of people who are spending the night in this house before they're crossing the next day. And what they were going to have to do is, you know, you know get, a, get a, a ride by a jeep or a van to the desert for an hour on paved roads, and they were going to walk across for, for 5, 10, 15, 20 miles across the desert uh, in, in real horrible terrain, hot, um, you know, rocky, mountainous, uh, desolate, and. Um, I was talking to a woman uh, who uh, had a three-year-old. The three-year-old didn't look, she looked like my, she did my daughter, she looked very similar to my daughter, I thought. And this woman was going to, the next day, she was going to make that trek, uh, go through the desert, walk through, um, not knowing precisely what was going to happen, and risk it all, literally risk it all. And this was the place where I was thinking, um, you know, how would you want to drive here I don't think you get cell phone reception. If my car broke down, I don't know what would happen to it. Uh, but people would, really, there's, you know, there's thousands of people willing to risk it all, willing to risk their family's life as well. And I, and I wasn't, you know, I was talking to some humanitarian workers, and, and I, I was just marveling at the fact that people would be willing to, to take that risk. And, which, you know, this woman was coming up, well, you shouldn't be judgmental. I said, I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just shocked by the risk they would take. Uh, and, 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 you know, she sort of said to me, you know, that, you know, they take a lot of other risks, but they stay home too, uh, in terms of economic um, deprivation. But it's just shocking to me how, how many people died and how many people are willing to risk um, horrible deaths to make it to this country.
we are running out of time. Can we use five more minutes of your, your time, Professor Johnson, before oh, we sure. end? Sure. Okay. I'm here. Okay, I see two two additional hands. And then we we have to ask you about the political campaigns, right? And what's happening with the Latina Latino vote, um, uh, insofar as the Democrats are concerned. Um, yes. I just wondered why uh, we haven't talked about the difference between fair trade and free trade. And this is what that uh, many people are so concerned about. It's agriculture uh, that has uh, decimated areas in Mexico with corporations coming in, developing mono agriculture with uh, herbicides and um, um, Fertilizers and farmers are, are taken off their land, and then the small farmers no longer. In addition, when the U.S. corn is subsidized and shipped into Mexico, and the farmers can't make any money growing corn anymore, and corn is a, a, a very, very important crop in Mexico, and they can't sell it. There, there's no way they can make money anymore, so they're taken off their land, and there's no way they can grow crops, I mean, there, there's a whole lot more involved that people, I think, need to consider. Why are people coming to the United States? They can't um, make a living back in Mexico because of these trade agreements. No, I think that's exactly right, and that's why some people are so critical of NAFTA and its impact on migration. It's displaced, uh, it's going to displace large numbers of you know, small farmers, uh, corn growers uh, and uh, has had, you know, unintended consequences that have contributed to migration pressures. And some would say we owe an even greater obligation uh, to Mexican migrants because of our role uh, in um, their economic displacement and their migration. Uh, so, so I think if you raise some very appropriate points, um, that we certainly have always acted in a way uh, that. Um, decrease migration pressures by making it a more humane assistance for the people in their homeland. You can look even more directly, perhaps, um, but similarly. Uh, the United States uh, was very involved with the governments of El Salvador and Guatemala in suppressing uh, distant groups in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, and before and after that as well. Uh, that led to massive dislocations of people and people fleeing the country. Uh, many of them came to the United States where we treat them very harshly, the way that I became involved in immigration law, in part was because representing a Southern and Guatemalan in asylum cases in the 1980s. Uh, and um, some would say, both in the economic world and the political world, we should look at our role in contributing to these migration pressures that we owe a duty to particular groups of immigrants because of all that. And I think that's the kind of question you're raising. Okay, final observation or question. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Professor Johnson, for being with us. I just have two brief questions. The first is, um, I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'm also a Catholic. And um, I just, I noticed for a fact there that we now say a special prayer in every mass to oppose some House Bill 1804, which they've declared to be like ungodly. So it's a huge issue. And so the idea is, and then also you mentioned the protest that were seen in California and Texas and other parts, Chicago and New York. but in large part on the border where that's actually happening. The question is, in your opinion, to what extent um, is the Catholic Church and other communities of faith that are reaching out their hands to illegal immigrants, to what extent are those communities um, legitimizing the effort? Um, is that a good thing? What, you know, what, how do you think that's, ha what's happening there? And then the second issue that I think is underlying a lot of this, um, I understand this is a sensitive subject, so I don't want to say it in a certain way to rile people up, but it, it seems as if, and this, dovetails with the comment that a young lady made back there. A lot of these arguments deal with utility and money. A lot of the arguments to me though deal with people as people and we're a land of immigrants and it deals with principle that a person needs to be dealt with as a person whether you're for kicking them out or leaving them here for amnesty or for whatever open borders. So I was wondering what are your thoughts on this whole debate people fighting with the principle versus utility arguments, because we've often seen those can never be reconciled. And then again, the community of faith question. Yeah, no, I think those are great questions. I, um, I was born and raised very strictly Catholic, and I paid some attention over the years 
um, deliberation theology and some of the, the tenets of the Catholic Church dealing with generosity toward the oppressed. And it had a, a, a huge impact on me when I went to El Salvador in the 1980s and visited Archbishop, Archbishop Romero's tomb in San Salvador and, and, and saw what religious groups were doing in that country, uh, even though I disagree with some tenets, particularly the Catholic Church. Uh, but I saw the very positive impact there were, you know, the, the church was having, giving people food, giving them land, trying to shield them from oppression. Uh, and I think that in this circumstance, um, some church groups that are reaching out, and, and I think um, the Archbishop in Los Angeles uh, and a number of religious leaders across the country, not just Catholic, but other groups, uh, are giving some moral legitimacy to some of immigrants' rights. Um, People protest and bring immigrants' rights. You know, um, the Archbishop in Los Angeles, uh, he, he was emphasizing, you know, we're not going to tell our parishioners not to just people need whether they're immigration status. We're just not going to do that, whether the tenth of the bill passes or not. And I think that you know, an Archbishop who, who says that uh, and writes an op-ed in the New York Times um, saying that uh, means a great deal. And, and I think that if you look at things like the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. When you think of something like an immigrants' rights movement in you know, this, this century, I think it's not going to happen just um, you know from you know immigrants. It's going to deal with you know, you know religious leaders, political leaders, citizens, and the like. And so I actually applaud some of the work that religious leaders have done. Now, and I, and I have to say, um, I look at different religions differently in thinking about immigration than I might have thought of them um, otherwise. Um, uh, the Mormon Church is very interested in immigrants and reaching out to immigrants. They're, they're interested in something, they're interested in new converts. Uh, and, but they're also interested in sending people on missions to other countries to help people in other countries. I guess I, I view that uh, as a good thing at nine different levels. And, and I uh, applaud that even though in certain circumstances some of the religious tenets aren't ones that I, I agree with. So, but I view that as, as very important. Uh, in the book, and, and I think that. Um, Comes through a little bit more. I think he's, to me, I'm just a country lawyer, and uh, I use whatever arguments I can get to, and make them sometimes. But I think there's some very utilitarian arguments you can make in favor of oh, more liberal admissions. To me, the ones that animate me probably more, but maybe not everybody else, are some of the moral ones that are so important. And if I think about some of the moral consequences of our current system, um, it's hard for me to say anything different than some of these things just make me sick. Uh, you know, the, the racial profiling, the human trafficking, the death on the border, uh, the inhumane and exploit, exploitative treatment of undocumented immigrants and immigrant workers. Um, it's horrible stuff that, in my view, we're going to look at what's happening today uh, along the border uh, as um, it's immoral and unjustifiable as we look at things like the, 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 the Japanese internment uh, and, and, and sort of you know, Jim Crow and the rest. It's just going to take us some time to get there. So to, to me, what motivates me, uh, in, in no small part, is the perception that this is just a, a most immoral and sick system that doesn't belong in a democracy like ours. Maybe that's too strong. <laughs> Maybe not. Thank you so much for your time, and perhaps we can get you to fly out here on another day to talk about uh, race and gender and the 2008 election, um, where, where I think that we might be able to discuss some of these issues in greater detail. I love you, and I'm very sorry I'm not out there with you. Oh, but we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Have a good e afternoon. Thank you.